I'm Elizabeth Luard. Welcome to the herb-scented hillsides of Provence. Here's the good news, particularly for lovers of fast food. The French don't really need to cook at all when they can market. Good food, and in France it's the best, begins in the marketplace. There's always a market within easy reach in rural France. Tuesday is market day in the old Roman city of vaison la romaine The stallholders take over the whole centre of the town. Small farmers make highly individual products, such as my favourite cheeses, little discs of goat's cheese, left to mature and grow a furry bloom of mould. The same little cheeses can be matured under oil. I love them. It's easy to make your own. The technique works with most cheeses. If you have a wedge of brie or camembert that's too hard, or something dull and over-pasteurized, you can chop it up and pop it in a jar with a tablespoon of dried herbs, top it up with olive oil, and in a week or two, it'll be transformed. The vegetable stalls are the center of attention in springtime. I'm after asparagus for lunch. And a bunch of artichokes. These are not immature, but a special variety grown to be harvested small. You can eat most of them, and the stalks as well. Today, there's the first of the strawberries from Carpentras. I like the look of those little lettuces, and for the main course, I've ordered spit-roasted rabbit with a couple of farm-reared quails, basted with olive oil and herbs. In France, the cook joints the meat before serving it. Father is not required to carve the roast. And I've asked for double rations of the deliciously oily herby juices. Lovely to dress a green salad. Here's the star of the hors d'oeuvre, a cured spiced pork sausage for slicing and eating raw. There's an enormous choice. Some are flavored with garlic, rolled in herbs, studded with nuts. Bread is a political issue, as Marie Antoinette found out to her cost. I'm not sure about this lot. The choice is good, but I really like my loaves fresh from the baker. You have to get up early in the morning to see the real thing, and this is the real thing. Pierre Leblanc is the baker in the village of Savoyon, up in the foothills of the Alps. His lovingly restored wood-fired oven is hungry for fuel. The bricks take a long time to take the heat. The oven must be high for bread. But once they're hot, they stay that way throughout the morning's baking. Pierre has been hard at work since the small hours. Every baker has his own specialities. These little breads are perfect for picnics. The bread maker's tools have been perfected over the centuries. There's nothing more delicious than good bread. With such a simple recipe, raw materials, the best flour, the purest water, the freshest leavening, the perfectly tempered oven, are what matters. Ask any self-employed baker who competes for custom with the big manufacturers. Pierre needs no bread moulds. He just shapes them by hand and puts them to rise in the special heavy linen cloth. This is Pierre's speciality. When he was courting his wife, he filled the window with bread hearts each morning so that she would see them as she went down the street and know he truly loved her. How about that for a fine range? Bread making rises to an art in this neck of the woods. 
These are the classic baguettes. And I have a reward for my early rise, a deliciously buttery croissant. This is the life. <laughs> These big round breads are the classic country-style loaf every baker makes. And here's the main batch of croissant, made with a basic fine bread dough layered with cold butter. The technique combines bread making with pastry making. And there is a bit over to make apple turnovers, chausson de pomme. They're so good. Salut. Salut. Alors, euh, mes deux pains. Deux pains. Deux pains au chocolat. Et une gratte d'eau. Carani. No problem. This state-funded agricultural farm is experimenting with the commercial cultivation of herbs, a most important traditional source of income in these uplands whether gathered in the wild or grown as a crop. Thyme, rosemary, bay, sage and oregano. There is no ill known to man they cannot soothe. And lavender for the long established perfume industry. The olive harvest has been the winter work of the Mediterranean peasantry for going on 5,000 years. The pure olive oils of Nyos are famous all over France, prized like fine wine. Today, my old friend, olive miller Paul Farnou of bouille baroni in the district of Nias is trimming the new growth on his young trees, so there will be a good harvest of fruit next year. This is no quick and easy crop. The olive tree, it is said, takes a hundred years to grow, a hundred years in full fruit, a hundred years to die. People say some of these trees are grafted onto rootstock, which goes back to the Romans. In rural communities, methods of processing have changed little over the millennia. The debris from the olive pressing, the grignon, is highly combustible and comes in handy as fuel for heating. Even in spring, it's cold in the thick stone walled houses. This boiler heats the whole house. The last task of the miller's year is making flavoring oils to be used for cooking and basting, sauces and salads. On cueillait ça en gardant les, les, les moutons, vous voyez Oui. Les vieux paysans faisaient comme ça à l'époque. Et c'est bon On s'est fort Ah, on s'est fort, mais c'est bon. Euh, vous savez, la grève qui est cuite avec euh, des, 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 des huiles aromatisées, c'était vraiment euh, sensationnel, quoi. C'était très bon. Different flavorings are good for different dishes. There's enough acidity in the olive oil to draw out the flavors and scents of the aromatics. In a couple of months, this will be powerful stuff. Rosemary is good with strong meats like beef. Thyme is lovely with chicken and rabbit. Oregano with vegetables. Fennel is the classic with fish. The millers make other high quality products with the leavings from the prized extra virgin oil, the first cold pressing. Olive oil is a marvelous beauty aid for the skin, for the hair, for protection against sun-induced wrinkles, and of course, it makes the gentlest of soaps. Huile d'olive, eh? Oui, vous voulez le bouteille de huile d'olive? Oui, c'est pas d'ici, c'est de plus... c'est bouche du Rhône, hein? C'est de l'huile d'olive et des bouches du Rhône, madame. Oui. C'est le plateau des Alpilles entre Saint-Rémy et Fontvieille. Oui. Vous connaissez un peu Saint-Rémy et oui, Fontvieille? Oui. oui. Les bonnes provence Oui, oui. oui. Euh, ça vient de Raphaël les là. Oui. Eh? C'est le, le plateau. C'est un très bon cru pour l'huile d'olive, hein? Oui, et c'est à vous. Voilà, ça c'est moi là. Uh -huh. Voilà, ok. Voilà. Vous voulez goûter
The best and biggest of the olive crop is saved for pickling and eating whole. Picked green at the start of the season and ripening to black as the year goes on. When home cured, the fruit is leached of its bitterness with many changes of fresh salted water, sometimes including wood ash for its lye. Once the bitterness has been drawn off, the fruit is then pickled in brine with aromatics or left to dry and lightly rolled in oil and herbs. And you can grow your own aromatics if you have a patch of garden. Fine honey, direct from the beekeeper himself. The inhabitants of Provence live most of their lives outdoors. The day is one long street theatre. What with the morning visit to the bakery, the day's marketing, or just settling down at the pavement cafe under the plane tree. The light is so beautiful, dappled shade and dancing sunlight, you can understand why it inspired so many great painters, Van Gogh and Cezanne, Matisse and Picasso and Braque. It's midday and everyone's off home for lunch. I have everything I need right here beside me. No cooking today, just straight from the market. Just the water for the asparagus and, and the um, artichokes and that's it really. And the salad. Tomato salad with garlic and parsley. Nothing on the lettuce because it's nice just to throw some olive oil in at the end or maybe wrap an anchovy up in it. This is just come as you please and eat what you want. Here's that lovely spit roasted rabbit and quail. So good. Just an extra sprinkle of thyme to gild the lily. Tomatoes sprinkled with chopped fresh herbs, tarragon and chervil. And now we only need olive oil and salt and pepper. Radishes, the French always have them with butter, very sweet, unsalted butter. And that's a tapenade, which is made with just black olives and olive oil all smashed up together. It's absolutely delicious. And you can have that with a lettuce too or with good bread. And this is a baby basil keeps the flies away. If you put it in the kitchen window, it stops anything coming through, people reckon. Cheese, good bread, and a nice well-cured mountain sausage. And strawberries with creme fraiche, with a slightly sour cream that the French are really very fond of. I think that's probably my favorite thing. The French housewife takes pride in her shopping skills, patronizing specialist food shops. And, far from pretending she did it all herself, will recommend her favorite traiteur, cooked food shop, often also the butcher, where ready-cooked dishes are prepared daily. I'm on a research trip. Bonjour. Couscous maison, s'il vous plaît, pour trois personnes. Oui. Merci. C'est poulet? Poulet, un, euh, volaille et bœuf. Ah bon? Voilà. Ça ira? Oui, merci. Je vous mets un peu de semoule avec? S'il vous plaît, oui. Oui. Couscous is a Moroccan dish. The French were always happy to pick up new culinary tricks from their colonial associates. Although it was the Romans, anxious to preserve the grain harvest of their colonies, who invented the technique of pre-cooking the milled wheat. 
This is a spread for the traiteur's own baby's christening party. Salmon en croûte, smoked salmon, ham, a spinach tion ready for reheating, eggs with salmon caviar. A lovely rough country pate and calves head cheese, traditional cold cuts and a fillet of beef. How's that for a takeaway? The collapse of market prices for agriculture as Europe recovered from World War II led to rioting throughout rural France. Pressure from the massive rural vote resulted in some extraordinarily protectionist legislation designed to help small farmers. Nevertheless, the small holding peasantry continues to migrate to the town, leaving half-emptied villages now being filled by second homeowners, with a sprinkling, perhaps more successfully, of good lifers, who raise families and restore the old crafts and services, bringing some life back into the abandoned rural strongholds. Down on the plain, where the Rhone winds down to the sea, the citizens of Aul have kept more than a few Roman tastes. These beautiful costumes are not just fancy dress, but a statement of identity, of national pride, by a people who, in spite of long suppression of their language and customs, still feel a sense of separate race. Today is the festival of St. George, patron saint of the Gautien, the horseman of the Camargue, the wetland which forms the delta of the Rhone. These celebrations and processions were revived in the 19th century by the great romantic Provencal poet, Frédéric Mistral, champion of the native tongue, the Languedoc, once the language of the troubadours and the medieval courts of love. The ladies of Aul are reputedly the most beautiful in all France, and the bull-herding horsemen of the Camargue must surely rank among the bravest. The procession's destination is the Church of Our Lady the Elder, in the shadow of the first century Roman amphitheater which dominates the town. In pre-Christian times, this was the site of a temple dedicated to Sabili, the cave-dwelling goddess of untamed nature and savage creatures, personified by the dragon. This is the land of the Tarrasque, a water-dwelling, fire-breathing, lizard-bodied monster whose periodic awakenings brought flood and other waterborne disasters on the people of this marshy delta. <laughs> The Christian church took on the battle against the forces of nature and the Tarasque was paraded in effigy round the streets of the towns of the Rhone Basin at the time of the spring plantings. The processions were once high-risk events. Spectators were liable to fall victim to the thrashing monster. The last death by Tarasque was recorded in 1891, not so long ago. The white horses of the Camargue are dark brown when they are born. The white comes gradually. By four or five years old, they are snow white. The people of the plain have their processions, but up here in the mountains, a good nourishing midday meal is the priority. <laughs> Annie Paco is the innkeeper at Savoyon. Her speciality is shoulder of lamb cooked with épautre. You have to wash the grains thoroughly to get rid of all the husk. The mountain lamb is small and lean with a fine flavor. And it goes onto a bed of tomato, tinned if need be, in a roasting pan. Add a dozen cloves of garlic, unpeeled. The flavor is much gentler if they're still in their jackets and plenty of seasoning, lots of pepper, or the dish will lack punch. 
Il faut mettre beaucoup, sinon c'est trop fade. Voilà. L'autre. Four handfuls of well-washed wheat or barley. Not too much because the grain swells right up as it cooks. Parce que si on en met de trop à la cuisson, après ça déborde. Hein. Parce que ça va gonfler, ça va arriver, ça va déborder après. Hein. A knob of butter at each corner. And a glass of water so the grains have enough liquid to swell. It starts in a high oven for the first half hour. Then you prick the meat so the juices run. Cover it again and put it back in the oven with the heat turned down a bit. It takes an hour and a half to three hours, depending on the size. Until the meat is so tender, it can be pulled apart with a fork. Meanwhile, Annie is getting together a simple first course. Grilled goat's cheese with a salad. You need a light and rich bread, pain de mie. Slices of milk bread or brioche will do very well. Lettuce for the salad. Olive oil. Shallots. The bread goes on the oven tray. The little goat's cheeses go on top. And a trickle of oil to finish. Then into a hot oven for seven to eight minutes. We need to make the vinaigrette for the salad. Annie, the prudent housekeeper, saves the olive oil for when you can really taste it, on the cheese. Sunflower oil does for the vinaigrette. Classic proportions are one of vinegar to three of oil. The lamb's ready. It smells wonderful. And the salad's ready to go. Doesn't it look beautiful? We're back in the main square in Vaison. The marketeers have all gone home. And it's time for a serenade from the headmaster of the secondary school. His small group of enthusiasts, Lou Kalu, gets together to play the old instruments, the galoube, a three-hold flute, and the tambourin, played single-handed to leave the other hand free for the flute. They sing the old songs in the Provençal tongue. Heaven alone knows what gave the people of Provence such a firm grip on the good things of life. Juniper and thyme and blue skies, scented hillsides, fertile fields and a perfect climate. Except, that is, when the Mistral howls down from the mountains and rattles the shutters and the eardrums off everyone, causing rifts between lovers, quarrels between devoted wives and husbands, the most saintly of children to pull faces. How on earth could you tell this was the Garden of Eden without a touch of the serpent tail Tarasque? Hey, 
Berenguiel, au dérocard. Au Magalis, tu t'es fâle au pays de l'Ondo. Yolo pescar, et me fâle, et te pescarat. 